Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to the Wellstone Center in St. Paul, Minnesota. I'm Joey Peters, general assignment reporter at Sahan Journal, and I'm moderating this Sahan community live event with our housing reporter. Hi, everyone. I'm Caitlin Vu. I'm excited to be here, Exci excited to um, have this conversation about elections. This election season has been a whirlwind and there's so much to discuss. Our goal tonight is to get past the talking points and hear about what this election season really means for people of color in Minnesota. We have a great group of panelists eager to unpack it all. We want to thank our media partners for helping us deliver this conversation to a larger audience. NPR News is partnering with us and recording this live conversation. Also, we're partnering with St. Paul Neighborhood Network to live stream this event on our YouTube page. Thanks to everyone watching on the live stream. And we want to include your thoughts and questions in this conversation too. If you have any questions or perspectives for our panelists, you can text us at 651-504-8170. Again, that number is 651-504-8170. Text us your questions and we will try to get them answered during our Q&A session after the panel discussion. Welcome everyone to the Wellstone Center in St. Paul, Minnesota. I'm Joey Peters, general assignment reporter at Sahan Journal. Sahan is a nonprofit newsroom dedicated to covering immigrants and communities of color in Minnesota. You are listening to Sahan Community Live in a conversation about elections in Minnesota. We are recording this conversation live with a great group of political pros and an audience of community members. I'm hosting this conversation with our Sahan housing reporter, Caitlin Vu. Hi, Caitlin. Hi, hi everyone. I'm excited to moderate this conversation about upcoming elections and what they mean for communities of color. If you didn't know where Minnesota was on the map before last week, you definitely do now. Governor Tim Walz joined the presidential ticket with Vice President Kamala Harris. This evening, we're planning to host a different kind of political conversation. We won't be asking who you're voting for, but what you're voting for. What are the issues and values that matter to you and to people in your family and your neighborhood? I'm sure our panelists here have been busy nonstop since that VP announcement. Thank you all for taking the time tonight to provide us with insight into what's happening and what's at stake on Minnesota. There's a huge diversity of opinion among people of color in Minnesota. We've invited guests from across the political spectrum and experts who've taken a deep look at how our elections work. Let me introduce our panelists. First, we have Abu Amara, a political analyst and attorney at Gustafson Glick, PLLC in Minneapolis. Thanks for joining us, Abu. Next, we have AK Kamara, Minnesota's RNC committeeman. Welcome, AK, nice to have you. Then we have Azarin Awal, the at-large city councilor in Duluth and program coordinator for the Office of Diversity and Inclusion at the University of Minnesota Duluth. Thanks for being here. And, and we also have Michael Minta, a political science professor at the University of Minnesota. And finally, Michelle Witte is here as well. Michelle is executive director of the League of Women Voters of Minnesota. Great to have you both here as well. Two days ago, Minnesota held its primary election. People voted for major party candidates for the U.S. Senate, U.S. House, and state legislative races. Voters also narrowed the field in some nonpartisan local races. Abu, I'm eager to hear what you think was the most interesting outcome. When you spoke to primary voters, what motivated them to turn out and participate? Well, first, I just want to say thank you for having me, um, and thank you to this panel. I'm looking forward to this uh, conversation. Um, you know, there were a couple of takeaways for me um, about what happened on primary night. The first being uh, the progressives had been a bit depressed, or turnout was down. The polling had indicated um, that progressive feelings were kind of reduced, if you will, right? Um, and then the change at the top of the ticket with Kamala Harris really has re-energized other people. Um, and so one thing I was looking forward to see if turnout would uh, be down relative to years past, up. And so I think looking at a couple of races, and I know we're here to talk about issues, but partly to get a sense of the feel, I think you gotta understand about you know turnout. Um, and you know one race I looked at in particular was the race uh, with Congresswoman Ilhan Omar to see whether there'd be increased turnout or decreased turnout. And in fact, she 
performed better than she did last time, um, where it was a closer race. That indicates to me that there is some level of increased intensity within kind of the progressive coalition, if you will. That's kind of one issue in Minnesota. Um, and then the, the second thing I was looking at to see is, and I'd love AK's thoughts on this, is uh, th there is a, a person of color running for the US Senate on the Republican side um, to see how he would have fared out, um, and, and he won their primary. And so I'm interested to see how those two dynamics play out for people of color, but more broadly, uh, the people of Minnesota. And yeah, AK, we, we do want to talk to you next about that. But first, uh, I want to hear more about your role as Minnesota RNC Committeeman. What does that consist of? Yeah, again, thank you so much for, for having me. Thank you to all the panelists. You know, a lot of the things that we do are very thankless. It's because we're passionate about um, our communities and for the values that we stand for. Um, I would say that, you know, the best way to describe what a national committee man does is you have the Republican National Committee, its national party, like GOP when you think of that. Um, and I am one of the 168 members that comprise the RNC. Every state in our six territories in the United States and one man and one woman. And really what my role is, is to represent the Republican Party of Minnesota to the national party, along with my female counterpart, Emily Novotny Chance. And so in order to really achieve that, I go around the state and I talk to different grassroots activists and people that are involved in the Republican Party, and I ask them, what do you want our party to tell the national party so we can still you know, have a voice when it comes to Minnesota's political interest to the National Republican Party? And it's been a fantastic ride. It's uh, you know, something that's a little bit different. Um, I come off a little bit different. I wear this flat brim hat all the time for audio listeners. I wear a flat brim. A uh, hat that has an American flag on it. I wear my diamond stud earrings. My wife's name is tattooed on my neck, but um, I'm an ardent supporter of the Republican Party. So thank you again. And hopefully that answers that question though, of what a national committee man does. Right, and now let's get to your thoughts on Tuesday's election. What, what are your takeaways? Yeah, so you know, one of the things Abu alluded to this is you know, us folks that love politics, we like to pour through the data. I'm a data guy. So I like to look back at previous presidential years, look at 2016, 2020, look at the primary turnout. Um, and in Minnesota, because we've separated now, you know, our, our presidential primary from the rest of our primary, it does change the dynamic a little bit. But um, we did have a primary challenge to our endorsed candidate, which is Royce White. And so a lot of people are looking to see how that would turn out, and Royce was victorious. So, you know, one of the things is, you know, looking at how the dynamics of the Republican Party truly are changing. You're starting to see a lot more black males that are getting involved in the Republican Party. Um, and just this simple fact that Royce White is the endorsed candidate one, so he first went to the grassroots body, he won that. And then for him to run statewide, and again, for Republicans to turn out and him to win the majority of the vote or the plurality, plurality of that vote, uh, shows that people in the Republican Party are not maybe the way that people frame it as like, you know, you're racist or xenophobic or something like that. And so it will be interesting going forward. Um, Royce does represent kind of this new populist wing um, that has swept into the Republican Party. And um, I'm excited to see how it's going to work out. I personally know Royce. I think he's a good man. And it will be interesting to see how this race really fighting for ideas and votes is going to play out here in Minnesota. Moving forward now, we are less than a week away from the Democratic National Convention. The Republicans finished their convention in July. And Michael, I wanna ask you, it's been decades since the parties actually chose a presidential candidate at these conventions. Why should people pay attention to them? And what are they actually about? What can we learn from them? Okay, uh, two things. So uh, thank you for inviting me and being on this panel. Um, also, that's pretty cool. You got your wife's, uh, yeah, I saw that, I'm like, man, I don't give my wife any ideas. Um, yeah, so I, I think, yeah, as you said, it's, it's, most of these conventions now have become like big commercials for the parties, um, but important commercials, right? Because a lot of people 
I mean, we're kind of like the political junkies and we pay attention to this all the time, but a lot of people are, maybe that's the first time they're turning it on, believe it or not, and getting a glimpse of the actual candidates. I know that's hard to believe, but yeah, and particularly for our governor, Tim Walls, I mean, he's going to get an introduction to the nation. And so the party, they want to get their message out. They want, it also serves as an opportunity to introduce future leaders um, and give them a platform and introduce them to the nation. Um, so I think voters, they, if they really want to hear about the policy issues, because like right now you see like a lot of the campaign is about personalities and, um, but at the convention you're gonna really get a flavor of what the Democrats stand for, uh, you're probably gonna see some attacks on the Republican Party in terms of their policy positions, really trying to say that there is a clear choice. Because right now, some voters, they may say, what's the difference between a Democrat and Republican? And that convention really gives the party an opportunity to say, hey, we are different, this is how we're different, and this is why we need your support in order to win the election. Let's go back to Abu. Um, Kamala Harris hasn't announced her platform yet. Can you tell us anything about the issues she's championing and what the connection is between these policy positions and what Minnesotans care about? Yeah, so it's a good question. Uh, here's what I would, to answer that question, I think we gotta step back and kind of lay out the tactical piece of this here. So obviously Kamala Harris is the Vice President of the United States. <laughs> In many ways her policy positions are going to be no different than um, than Joe Biden, although there will be some areas, and I think one example is uh, the war in Gaza and Israel. I think I've seen some movement from the vice president in a way that's a bit different um, than, than President Biden. But I think what she's doing over the last three weeks and will be doing probably until after the convention is actually a reintroduction of who she is, right? Um, I, I, I don't wanna be remiss and, and not acknowledge we are witnessing something this country has never seen before. We are witnessing a black woman running for the presidency and providing the space for her to be able to articulate her narrative and story to the American people before we get into the particulars of policy A, policy B, and those are all important. So I think that's what we've been seeing over the last three to four weeks, framing her narrative. What is, what is she running for from a value proposition standpoint? Um, now, going to the policies, where I expect her to hammer home is through this central theme of freedom. We've been hearing that consistently. Why is that important? If you look at the past couple of cycles, the issues that have permeated not just progressive circles, but more broadly to the population at whole have been around a woman's reproductive right, choice. That at its core, Democrats have grounded in freedom. The, the second has been really transforming the economy to talk about how do individuals have freedom in their lives, freedom to uh, avoid uh, bankruptcy because of health care, freedom from as opposed to freedom to. And so I suspect that lens, through the lens of freedom, is how you'll see a series of her policy proposals uh, be articulated both at the convention and then moving forward. And just really quickly, you alluded to, you've seen some movement on Gaza from her, but she currently serves in the Biden administration, of course. What, can you talk more about that or what movement have you seen? Yeah, so here's what I would say. So policy happens both in rhetoric and then ultimately in, in action, right? Um, in, well, she's the vice president, so in policy she actually can't, she doesn't control the government, right? She, she's the number two. So she is following the guidance of ultimately the, the president. But in terms of rhetoric, I have seen, and I, you know, maybe this is my opinion only, I have seen what I'd call rhetorical daylight, um, signaling not just to the democratic coalition, but signaling to partners across the world that she would, at least in emphasis, talk differently about the conflict. Second, the sense of urgency she speaks with about the conflict suggests to me that there may be, at least privately and maybe even publicly, different decisions, tactical decisions about, for example, whether to send battleships to that particular region over uh, a conflict or the, the level of munitions you would send over, right? So those, those types of tactical decisions. I have seen rhetorical daylight, at least over the last three, four weeks between her and the current uh, president. Yeah. 
And during the presidential primary in March, uncommitted Minnesota encouraged voters to cast a ballot for uncommitted in order to convince elected officials to call for a permanent ceasefire in the Israel-Hamas war. And 46,000 Minnesota primary voters did just that. With President Biden on the uh, with President Biden off the ticket, Azarine, what is uncommitted Minnesota asking voters to do for the November general election? Azarine, you helped introduce a ceasefire resolution in Duluth calling for a permanent end to the war, humanitarian assistance, and the release of Israel, um, Israel and Palestinian civilians held hostage. In March, the Duluth City Council rejected that resolution by a five to four vote. So can you tell us what you're hearing from your constituents about the uncommitted campaign and where do you think uncommitted Minnesota heads next? Thank you so much for the uh, question and thank you for inviting me on the panel. Um, again, my name is Azreen, I use she, they pronouns. I'm an at-large Duluth City Councilor. Um, back in March, I was uh, active in Duluth around the uncommitted vote. Um, and really, the vote uncommitted Minnesota began as a movement to really give, as you said, the uncommitted voters a choice in the primary election um, to protest President Biden's enabling of a genocide in Gaza. And now, after 46,000 Minnesotans voted uncommitted, we have 11 uh, uncommitted delegates going to the DNC. Uh, where uncommitted is moving, heading as a movement, um, so I'm not talking about individual voters, but like as a movement, Uncommitted is really wanting to see um, the vi uh, Vice President Harris um, make clear her policy decisions around Gaza. And what we truly want to see, what we really want to see is a um, arms embargo and a permanent and immediate ceasefire. And I think right now voters are struggling with that decision of um, who to vote for in November, but we know the movement will not be endorsing um, until they really hear that an arms embargo and a permanent and immediate ceasefire is, is supported by um, Vice President Harris. And I'm just curious, are you seeing the same narrative shift from her that Abu alluded to on this topic? I have. Um, I think uh, in her rhetoric, she um, is, uh, we could say that she is more sympathetic or empathetic to the Palestinian um, cause and um, is hearing what um, essentially 86% Democrats, 65% independents, and even 56% Republicans are saying across the nation, which is they are supportive of a ceasefire. And I think she is sympathetic towards the Palestinian um, cause and she's hearing what the voters are saying. But what Uncommitted really needs from her is not just words, we need actions. Um, we really need to see um, how, like her commitment and her ticket's commitment, um, again, to humanitarian aid, human rights, um, valuing lives of not just um, Palestinian lives overseas, but also you know, our um, Americans here who are, who are facing increased Islamophobia, anti-Palestinian racism, anti-Arab racism, and even um, uh, xenophobia and anti-Semitism, right? Um, these things need to be addressed at the national level. Um, we're seeing our constituents, I'm seeing my constituents calling out for this. Um, so I am seeing a shift in tone, but again, we need to really see those actions. And I want to ask this question, Azarine, and um, I know this is a personal topic, and I hope you don't mind me asking, but um, how are you feeling about your vote in November? That is a very personal question. Um, I'm struggling. I'm really struggling. I, um, I'm an immigrant, and I take the ability to vote very seriously. Um, I have tried to vote in every election, primary, general. Um, my, since I was able to vote, um, and I am struggling this year. I, I am one who values um, human rights. Um, it is what propels me in the work that I do. It's social justice, human rights. It's the ability to give all our brothers, sisters, and neighbors 
the, the freedom to live and just be themselves and coexist in harmony. And right now, what our government's actions are doing by the party that I supported is contrary to that. It's contrary. We are hearing from international courts that what is happening is not okay. And yet we are continuing to enable a genocide. We're continuing to enable vast human rights violations and tremendous loss of life, of, of loss of youth. So I am struggling quite a bit. Um, and which is why the uncommitted um, vote resonated with me in the primary, where I wanted to really send that message and be able to use my vote to send a message that we need something to change by the, President Biden's administration. And now as we're moving forward to the November election, we continue to need, need to see that change. We continue because the catastrophe is just getting worse. And frankly, I think we're losing our moral ground if we had any through this on the global stage. So I am struggling with my vote in November because I want to fight against fascism. I want to protect our democracy. But I also want to make sure that my vote is not going towards a genocide. My vote is not going towards human rights violations. And for me to vote um, in November, I need to see some significant changes, not just in the tone, but also policies. Thank you for sharing. And I'm sure a lot of voters think this as well. Um, but I want to shift gears a little bit to uh, Michelle. So Michelle, the League of Women Voters in Minnesota works to increase civic participation in government. What have you been hearing from communities of color in Minnesota about the upcoming November elections, and how are their concerns different this year from maybe other years? Yeah, thank you so much. Again, great to be here with the panel and to represent our 104-year-old organization, uh, really, which was formed out of the suffragists who really said, hey, we need to keep people voting and have been working toward um, opening up the vote for so many people over all these hundred years. We have 35 leagues across the state, so we actually hear from a lot of different pockets of different communities of color in our native communities, uh, all the different communities we, we love and cherish here in Minnesota. But I wanted to focus on our new voters because that's often where we, where we see a lot of kind of what, what's happening out there. And what's exciting is we do the voter registration for all newly naturalized citizens. So we register to vote probably almost, you know, between 10 and 15,000 <clears throat> newly naturalized citizens every year. And they have an opportunity after they've been naturalized to, you know, to, to come out and vote. And without exception, I mean, it's, it's you know, probably 99% of them, we go with this massive stack. Um, and what that says is they are excited, right? I am here, I am excited, my vote matters. Um, and that is exciting to see. Now, the flip side of that is this year, what we've seen is we have this parallel um, kind of world of people who are immigrants, who we also value but are undocumented, who don't have their citizenship papers yet, who I think are facing um, a lot of backlash, unfortunately, with election mis and disinformation, especially about um, um, automatic voter registration. People feel that, oh, now that people can get a driver's license, being undocumented, that they will automatically be registered to vote. Um, and we um, have launched a big letter to the editor campaign, really working in our communities to say, no, our safeguards are well in place. There's already a precedent for people who are not citizens. Uh, to not vote. So we see that sort of that backlash within communities of color, people who can't vote. The second group we're working with are young people. And I think that's, again, looking at those new voters. Um, we have a new law. We have 32 new laws, election laws, which make voting so much more accessible uh, in Minnesota. But one of them is we can pre-register our 16 and 17 year olds now to get them more engaged. And what's interesting is in Minnesota, young people 18 to 24 have been voting 20 points less than, than average in, uh, than adults, other older adults. But when they're registered to vote, they're voting over 90%. 
So what we're seeing is that investment in getting them registered and in the process sooner, right, because there's that gap. They are motivated, right? Um, but we have heard a lot of them really saying, I don't like this rancor, right? I, they're just like, I don't, why don't, I don't want this. Who are these people? And so because of that, we partnered with the Secretary of State, also with the Minnesota GOP and the Minnesota DFL together to go out to schools across the state for National Voter Registration Day on September 17th. So we're trying to get every high school to sign up and make voting look like it should be a traditional thing that we all do. Thank you. Um, so through my reporting at Sahan Journal, I've spoken to several Somali voters who feel a positive connection with President Trump's views on economic opportunity and traditional social values. AK, could you tell us more about what actions a new Trump administration would take on the economy and social values, especially involving LGBTQ issues? Yeah, so when it comes to economics, it's pretty straightforward. Um, one thing that President Trump loves is trying to be as clear and concise as possible. Some people say that he talks down to like a fifth grade education, but I think that it's important for people to, to actually understand what he means in very plain language. So he's launched uh, Agenda 47, and there's 20 points that are very straightforward about what he wants to accomplish um, if he is reelected to the presidency. And so when it comes to economics, it's very simple. Be able to unleash American innovation. How do you do that? You have to have better trade deals. How do you do that? When you approach the global economic stage, we have to assert our dominance as America and say, we're not going to sign off on deals that are detrimental to American workers. And so I think a lot of people are starting to see that that's something that is drastically different than the Biden-Harris administration. And I think that when it comes to you know, people that are East African, that have more a, of a conservative kind of cultural value system, you know, what we say to them as a Republican Party and President Trump is that we want you to be able to assert your belief in your religious system. We believe that if you are in a school system and, and you don't want your child to be learning information that you think goes against your culture and your values, you should be able to opt out of that. And so I think that that type of resonance, when we talk about freedom and the ability to choose what it is that your children are consuming, that's something that Republicans and President Donald Trump stands with. And I think that, again, this is starting to resonate with um, a lot of the uh, Muslim population, and again, those that are more uh, culturally or traditionally conservative in their values. And I think that President Trump is, is, again, pushing forward. He's not telling people what you have to believe, but instead saying that you as a parent should have the freedom to be able to choose for your parental rights what it is that your child is able to be exposed to, and that if you don't want your child exposed to certain things, you should be able to opt out. Abu, I want to ask, you know, it seems that um, the media sometimes uh, paint some of our communities as kind of a monolith. How is the Democratic Party working to reflect the wide diversity of opinions in communities of color about issues like immigration and public safety? Well, the, the, no question that communities of color are not a monolith. I think we just heard okay, articulate a vision that's different than I think I would. Um, and so I think that speaks to the diversity um, within um, different communities. I, I, would, I would just broadly say that I think when you don't engage community in an actual conversation, if you simply just report on what's happening in community, you don't understand community. And that's how we get this monolithic notion. So the idea of like digging deeper uh, to see some nuance I think is important. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't respond to a couple of things. I think one of the, on the policy front, um, AK referenced a couple of things. I think everybody should be aware of Project 2025. Um, to me, this is one of the most disastrous pieces of potential legislation and ideals articulated as a manifesto uh, probably in the last 50 years. So how would it impact brown communities, communities of color? Um, as proposed, and again, the people proposing this are all former Trump administration officials or campaign officials. There would be mass deportations. That is not my, what I'm saying, that is what the policy states. This is a 920 page document. So what does that mean for our communities? I think it means fear. I think it means state-sponsored terrorism on communities. We have communities here who, have, who are supported, who, are, who love this state, who love this country, who are contributing in so many ways, and the idea that we would say to them, we would mass deport you 
to me is the antithesis, I think, of what it means to be a Minnesotan and what it means to be American. So I just had to point that out. There are some serious policy divisions uh, between the Republicans and the Democrats, and I think Project 2025 is a perfect example of that. Michael and Michelle, what do you think candidates and campaigns get wrong when they're engaging with voters of color? Um, what are some of the biggest misconceptions, say, uh, campaigns get about African American voters, for example? Yeah, I'll start. I think the biggest thing is um, the transactional nature sometimes we make of, of elections. You know, we come in, we want your vote, we want to register you to vote, and goodbye after that. And so what we hear a lot of is, hey, if you're going to engage with our community, um, you know, especially for those of us who you know, are not people of color and we're coming in and we're working as neighbors and friends, it's like, where are you after that? And I think for candidates, we hear that a lot. A lot of people are very, um, they're like, hey, I've been voting forever and nothing's changed in my life. So I think we have to be more um, committed, all of us, to being there for the whole run and not just seeing elections as this thing that happens every two or every year, essentially, but for a lot of people, just every four years in the presidential election, and we need to show up and, and be there for the full of the community needs. Candidates, as well as those of us are, like are, we're in the nonpartisan field, but we need to all be there serving those interests year round. Well, I mean, I think part of it, you know, political parties, I mean, their job is to get the most votes possible, right? Try to find something that's not divisive, but unify. And so the communities, when you look at a pan-ethnic identity, so like if you say the Asian American community, um, what does that mean? Are you talking about Indian Americans? Are you talking about Chinese Americans? And so parties, I mean, they have a, they have a difficult time. So when you say Asian American, what does that mean in terms of outreach? Well, what issues are you talking about and how does that resonate? So parties really are just say, hey, let's try to find one issue and see if we can get some consensus. And even here, like in Minnesota, I mean, I moved here about eight years ago. I mean, black, we've always known it was a pan-ethnic identity. But it truly is here in Minnesota, right? It is a, you know, a, a large East, Af East African community, Somali, um, blacks who've been here for a while. You know, sometimes I, I've heard some of my friends says like, you know, where, where are you from? Uh, I'm from a small town in South Carolina, right? So it's because we have such a large, vibrant immigrant population here. And so when you talk about issues that affect the black community, you can't use the same messaging that you say in St. Louis, Missouri, that you have, you just can't use that same message. And I say, I think parties, but again, that's the challenge, right? They're trying to find this common issue, and a lot of times they miss that diversity and the messages, because things that are happening here may be totally different from what's happening in Chicago or St. Louis. So that's, I think that's what the parties, I think they understand it, but with limited resources and time, they have to shoot for that overall unifying message. Okay, well, and one last thing. And, and, and what, so Democrats have that challenge because of the diversity. Republicans have the challenge because they think if they say, we put, um, what is it, uh, Amber Rose mm -hmm. up there, that somehow she's gonna connect to black people and they're going to connect to young people. And, um, and, and, and I don't know Royce White, but that Royce White, if you put him on the ticket, that he's going to connect. Because most voters, they may not pay attention all the time, but when you don't speak to the issues that move the community, having people up there that look like you isn't enough. Because if that was the case, Democrats would have just nominated Kamala Harris in 2020, or they would have nominated Cory Booker. Instead, they went with the candidate that best represented their interests and also had the best chance of winning. So, thanks. Michelle, what are the biggest challenges that keep communities of color from participating in elections, or what are the challenges you see? So many, but I would say what we see, I mean, again, in our work of voter engagement out, um, you know, a lot of, go to a lot of farmers markets and festivals and other things in the communities. It is still lack of information, you know, just I don't know who the candidates are. Who are these people on here? 
Um, and I think that knowledge, you know, again, so grateful for, you know, Sahan Journal and, you know, we do our big vote 411 voter guide. All the people really still are hungry for information and it's become even harder now because there's so much mis and disinformation uh, that people don't know who to trust. So I think information is still a really big piece of the puzzle. Also, if you are a new voter and, you know, or you haven't voted in a long time, you know, just the process itself, when we had 32 new election, 32 new election laws, what do all those mean? So I think that's really still a big challenge. I want to take a minute to remind our audience that you're listening to a Sahan community live discussion. We're calling, what are you voting for? We're recording this live at the Wellstone Center on St. Paul's West Side. And if you're here in person or watching the live stream, please text us your questions. As a reminder, that number is 651-504-8170. We'll get to those questions soon. Our panelists are Abu Amara, a political analyst and an attorney at Gustafson Gleck PLLC, A.K. Kamara, Minnesota's RNC committee man, Azarine Awal, an, an at-large city councilor in Duluth, Michael Minta, a political science professor at the University of Minnesota, and Michelle Witte, the executive director of the League of, Minis of Women Voters of Minnesota. During the last legislative session, the state DFL passed a slate of bills that included driver's licenses for undocumented immigrants, universal school lunch, legalized weed, a higher gas tax, and college funding for lower income families. Abu and AK, what would happen if some of these initiatives, and what would happen to some of these initiatives if Minnesota Republicans won back the state house? Uh, so a couple of things, um, you know, I'm going to get to your point, but I wrote an op-ed that was in the Star Tribune about Project 2025. I think it's important for, for listeners and anyone that's here today to understand that President Trump uh, said that Project 2025 is not his thing. They've disavowed it. Now, personally, I think that Project 2025 is a fantastic document because I'm a conservative, I'm a limited government conservative, and I think that that's actually the best way for a government to actually function. Um, but I do think that when you kind of create this caricature of what something is, sometimes things get mixed. Um, I also want, just want to say quickly, too, that the way that these elections work, um, especially with Royce White, he didn't run because he's um, a black man that's from Rondo neighborhood in St. Paul. He ran because he wants to actually represent the state of Minnesota. He just happens to be a black man that's from Rondo neighborhood in St. Paul. And so I think that Republicans don't vote because of these identity characteristics. It just happens to be that I, the man sitting before you, happen to be a black man as well because I represent a set of ideas that people felt resonated with me um, and with them. And so just wanted to say that. Now, in regards to certain legislation that was passed by the DFL um, State House and State Senate and signed by Governor Walls, uh, make no mistake, Republicans have a completely different view of things like driver's license for all. We feel that fundamentally it's a carrot that will entice people that are undocumented, that are here without permission, or what we would call a criminal alien from being here. And we think that that's a bad thing. So it's important. I think that there's nothing wrong with being very candid about what our positions are. And if there are people that are afraid within these communities that are criminal aliens or undocumented, then yes, there should be a fear because if you broke a law to come here, if President Trump and Republicans do get in power, we want to enforce the law. Now, is it going to be the scary thing? No, President Trump has actually talked about how he wants to actually take local law enforcement and give them the power and authority so it doesn't, be, it doesn't have to be this messy, nasty thing. Because believe you and me, if you see videos of like, you know, unmarked vehicles kicking in doors and harming people, that's not gonna fly with the American people. But I still think that it's important that as a Republican, as someone that represents uh, the Republican Party, that we do believe in the rule of law. And so, yes, it is true that if Republicans do take power in the State House and the State Senate, there is going to be a move to roll these things back. And I think that that's what we represent. That's who we represent as Republicans in the state of Minnesota. So, uh, you know, from my Spanish point, luckily, the, no matter what happens this election, the Democrats will be in control of the executive branch. We will have the governor. We will either have Governor Flanagan or we will have Governor Walls. And either 
who is in charge will not let the rollbacks that I think AK talked about from actually being implemented. So I just want to point that out, number one, all the progress we've made over the last two, four, six years are locked in at least until 2026. And the second thing I want to point out, and I, and I give AK credit for being honest and transparent about the Republican position on these issues. I would argue that's why they have not won a statewide race since 2006. They continue to lose at the ballot box. Minnesotans continue to reject those ideas. They continue to articulate those ideas, and they continue to lose elections. And so I would say to those folks who, who have seen the progress over the past couple of years, like feeding children, what a controversial idea, we're such animals. Um, those ideas, if you support those ideas, make sure you continue to engage in that process because those are the things over the course of several elections that could be taken away if uh, the state were to go in a different direction. Yeah. A lot of immigrants in Minnesota struggled with the costs of food and especially housing through Biden's presidency. What is Vice President Harris planning to do to lift up those costs, pressures for Minnesota voters? Yeah, this is a great question. And so for background, I am a, a civil rights and consumer rights lawyer. That's what I do every day. So when I go to work, I sue companies for price gouging, for antitrust conspiracies, for screwing over consumers and workers and people's civil rights. So I feel like I have a pretty good lens on what's happening here. Uh, there's kind of two pieces here. One of them is around um, consolidation. If you see markets today and you compare them to where they were 20, 30, 40 years ago, they were much more consumer friendly, meaning prices were lower, margins weren't as high, right? Because massive corporations were not as making as much. That's the complete opposite today. We've had massive consolidation in markets. And what ends up happening is you as the consumer pay more. That's why you're seeing some of the largest agricultural antitrust cases in the country, price gouging at its height during the COVID-19 pandemic that continually jack up prices. So the first thing I think we've got to do is get serious with the DOJ and I suspect uh, the FTC, Federal Trade Commission, with uh, Vice President Kamala Harris. I suspect she'll talk about economic justice, not just through the lens of like higher wages, which are all important, but actually making sure that the economy works for consumers and not simply for shareholders. I think that's an important thing that I, I suspect you'll see her talk about. And then the second thing I think you're gonna see her talk about is the role of bargaining power. You know, the other end lens of this is we're all consumers, but we're also all workers. And what's the role that um, the NLRB, the National Labor Relations Board, can play in assisting workers in balancing power. Nobody is saying workers should control everything all the time, no matter what. That's not the argument. The argument is simply saying there has to be a balance. There has to be a balance in power so that people can effectively bargain for what they help produce. And so I think those two things are areas you will see Kamala Harris and hopefully a Kamala Harris administration um, push, uh, make, some, make some headway on. AK, Minnesota is currently home to an estimated 80,000 undocumented immigrants. Former President Trump has made widespread deportations a main plank of his immigration platform. What's your message to undocumented people in Minnesota and to voters from immigrant communities? What can we actually expect to happen in a second Trump administration? Yeah, so again, this is all part of Agenda 47. It's on the website. It's a great way to be able to actually find out what does President Trump, what do Republicans want to actually help him accomplish um, if he wins. And it's, it's very simple. If you are a legal immigrant, you have nothing to fear. I am the child of a legal immigrant that came to this country in 1979. I understand. I understand that there are situations in which people come to this country under terrible duress. And I don't fault that that was your intent. But I think it's important for people to understand that if President Trump wins, your best path is to come through legally. If you are here not legally, I think self-deportation is probably the best option. Now, ultimately, I think that, again, this is a very clear distinction between what do you believe is important, enforcing rule of law or not enforcing it. The Democrats, even going back to the primary in 2020, stood on stage and every single one of the presidential uh, candidates said that they want to remove the actual criminal liability from entering this country and move it to be a civil matter. 
Republicans do not believe that. And also, when I go and I talk to people in the immigrant community that came through legally, they have the same sentiment. This is not an issue that is just like, if you are an immigrant or the child of an immigrant, that somehow you're just like, we don't care about enforcing the border. Now, if you have a difference of opinion, I understand that. But this is why we have to win, you know, basically hearts and minds based off of what our messaging is. Very clear, very candid. If people reject that, that's the great thing about this country is that you have the right to think whatever you want. And political parties go out and they try and convince people, if more of you believe my vision, vote for me. If you vote for the other person's vision, vote for them, and then we move forward as a society. So I think it's important to kind of clarify that. And there also is just one other thing that I wanted to mention. When it comes to kind of like thinking about this monolith way that we kind of view different communities and say, well, this is like the immigrant community, there are so many different flavors that are within that community. And again, I will just, again, speak to the idea that people that are here without permission, there is a completely different viewpoint that many Americans hold that support Republicans up and down the ballot all across this state, all across this country, that we need to be able to enforce our border for one very simple reason. America is for Americans. And if you are an American citizen, we need to be able to do everything in our power to give you the greatest opportunity. And it's just truly a numbers game. If you are not an American citizen, there's all of these other questions about what rights should you be afforded in regards to economic viability? Should you have to take a second place or a back seat as an American citizen to someone that's not an American citizen? I say no, Republicans say no. If you don't agree with that, then don't vote for the Republicans. If you think that that's a reasonable argument, then vote for Republicans. So much political campaigning, especially for the presidential race, feels like it plays to people's fears and negative betrayals of the opposing candidate or party. Michael, has it always been this way, and does that kind of messaging work with voters? Well, political scientists, you know, a lot of times you hope Messaging, negative advertising, trying to pay on fears. Um, yeah, both parties have engaged in that that type of um, method because because it works. Now, now Democrats are hoping um, that as the coalition has bit gotten more diverse over time, um, that, you know, you can't play those type those type of messaging and trying to be more inclusive. It's, is, is the way to go and to try to bring people together. Um, on the Republican side, there's diversity, but not a lot of racial and ethnic diversity. Um, and so some of the messaging that's happening, politics of fear, I mean, I even hear some of the messaging right now by the former president, you know, attacking Kamala Harris's uh, intelligence, competence. I mean, that's just the same playbook that's used over and over again. And it's not just my opinion, there's, there's a lot of political science research, political psychology, where that researcher trying to appeal to racial fears. Even immigration, we're sitting up here having a conversation, I'm listening about immigration. When we're thinking about immigration, we're thinking about people south of the border, Mexican Americans, Central Americans. But there are people from all over the world in the United States that are here that are undocumented. Some of it could just be simply you overstay your visa. So these type of messages can be powerful because they do tug at people's fears that you might be losing. Um, I'm still trying to figure out what a black job is. Um, <laughs> uh, but that type of messaging, like, you even hear that, that you could lose your job, your black job. And I mean, that type of messaging. But it, it is based in some fear, right? If you're, if you're in certain parts of the South, whether you're in Alabama, if you're in North Carolina, and you see a Latino community moving in, and, you, and then you say, OK, I'm not getting a job because I see more Latino. So, so there is just enough to play on people's fears. It may not necessarily be true. I mean, maybe that job you had moved overseas or something. But those are the type of fears that the party, and, and Democrats, Republicans, and I'm, I'm, Republicans also say Democrats are playing this game too. That 
authoritarianism, you're going to lose your rights, your fear, if, if, you, if you pick Donald Trump, all your rights are going to be eviscerated. So Democrats are kind of engaging in that also. Um, and the reason why parties do it is because it works. And until it stops, then parties will stop using it. Um, so let's talk a little bit about Kamala Harris. So if she were elected, she would be the first woman and the first Asian to be president. Azureen, I want to ask you, is that historic achievement meaningful to Minnesota voters? What are voters you're speaking with saying about their connection to Harris's identity and her story? Thank you for the question. It would be a first, right? of many things. First woman, first black woman, um, first thisy, um, of thisy um, heritage. But as we've heard over and over in this panel, that speaks to identity politics. While representation is important, and while I would argue that we are behind in representing um, the identities of um, our nation in our political systems, I would know as the first Asian American, first immigrant, first Muslim, um, first queer woman in the city council in Duluth, Minnesota. Representation's important, yes. And I think voters are, see are, that is something that they're seeing and that they're appreciating. But at the same time as we've discussed, values and what the candidates' um, uh, policies are, I think are equally, if not more important here. We're electing a candidate that will lead us, that will lead us into the next, um, that will continue to expand, grow the United States, that will continue to um, you know, advance our values at the national stage, right? That is what voters are looking at, and we can see that with the uncommitted votes, like uncommitted uh, movement, that voters are looking for someone, regardless of their identity, who will stick to um, making sure human rights are protected here and abroad. So I think that um, the, the real discussion, as we've heard here, is that what are truly the policies and the values of the candidates that we elect? Uh, Michael, do you agree with that? Or, or, do you also, or do you think historic first still motivate Minnesotans to vote? Or do you think policy plays into it well, as well? Well, I, I mean, it's... it's, it's I mean, we have a governor, so Democrats are going to be very excited and motivated to vote for, for Governor Walls on this ticket. Um, Republicans, maybe less so, right? And independents, we'll, we'll see, right? Um, but in terms of Kamala Harris being at the top, I mean, yes, I mean, you already see the enthusiasm with all of these different groups, you know, uh, when would, when would uh, me, black men or um, you're seeing all these different groups, what, white dudes? I mean, you're, you're seeing all these groups that are popping up that are, and you're seeing this type of enthusiasm. And that usually comes with a first because Vice President Harris represents, not only is she a woman, She's a black woman. She's a South Asian woman. So I think that here, you know, we have a, a significant, um, not super large, but, but look in the Twin Cities areas with black, South Asian. And I think there is going to be some excitement. And that usually, and that's what, and I think that's what the Democrats were hoping would happen by having her on the ticket, that she would have this enthusiasm, and you can already, even the polling is showing that the enthusiasm gap is just out the window, and you can see it by the different racial groups. I think now Harris, I mean, is points ahead, way points ahead of where Biden was in terms of enthusiasm for minorities, young people, women, and that's usually what happens when you have one of these historic firsts where people come out. Uh, many, now, Republicans are saying, you know, this is the honeymoon phase, it's going to fade away. I, 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 I don't know. I, I, I think there's real enthusiasm. It's the money, the people that are signing up. I, I think that this, this is what Democrats wanted. This is what they wanted to, uh, and, and it seems to be working. Um, 
Now, some people I've said will, I'm kind of know your question, that will Republicans do the same thing? Now, obviously it's too late, but I mean, but I've heard those type of conversations. So first we had Hubert Humphrey in Minnesota, and then we had Walter Mondale. Michael, what do you think makes Minnesota such a great state for vice presidential picks? Is it because we can handle brutal winters? <laughs> you know, I, I don't know. Um, I mean, I think, I think Governor Walls, and I mean, obviously, uh, Hubert Humphrey, too, is, is that there, it's the right time. I mean, it's just the moment. I mean, Walls, I mean, the Midwest, many, many, the, both parties know that to, the, the path to the presidency is through the Midwest. And so even though there was talk about uh, Governor Josh Shapiro um, and I think Mark Kelly out in Arizona, but I mean, Tim Walls, I mean, when you think of a Midwestern person, he's that kind of guy. He's a football coach. He talks, I mean, he looks like you want to go run through a wall when you hear him talk. Um, he, he, he's, he really, and I, and I found it hard to believe, he truly is kind of one of these everyday Americans. He doesn't have a, he doesn't have like stock, he doesn't own a home. That's kind of like everyday Americans, right? Uh, so, I mean, he is a person who can articulate the concerns and the messaging. And so I think that's what being in the Midwest, people try, I, I mean, people try to paint Governor Walls as this, this so he, he's, he represents the progressive wing. He's, he's not offensive to the progressive wing. He also is fairly moderate um, within the Midwest. And so that messaging is important. And I think that, uh, yeah, uh, Minnesota, I mean, I think that it's putting us on the map. We're getting a lot of, lot of discussion, and I think it's, it's exciting. Um, I just want to take a minute to remind our audience that you're listening to a Sahan Community Live discussion about elections in Minnesota. We're recording this at the Wellstone Center in, in St. Paul's West Side. And if you're here in person or watching on the live stream, you can text us our questions. And you can text us your questions. As a reminder, that number is 651-504-8170. And we'll get to those questions very soon. Our panelists here are Abu Amara, a political analyst and an attorney at Gustafson Gleck PLLC, A.K. Kamara, Minnesota's RNC committee man, um, Azrin Awal, an at-large city councilor in Duluth, Michael Minta, a political science professor at the University of Minnesota, and Michelle Witte, the executive director of the League of, Min of Women Voters of Minnesota. As we get closer to the election, a lot of misinformation starts to circulate about basic voting practices, things like absentee ballots, same-day registration, and voting rights for people who've been incarcerated. Michelle, what are some common voting rights in Minnesota that people have that people often forget about? Well, we have so many more now, and I'm so glad you asked that question. Um, that really is our space, right, is we want to make sure that every voter uh, feels safe in their elections. So, so we really, you know, support our, our rule of law, to making sure that all of our rights are protected and our spaces are protected against any political violence that can happen that we have seen occur. And so in, in light of that, a lot of us have worked very hard to have several new things that are out there. The first one really that we worked uh, with so many other partners over the year was Restore the Vote to uh, basically, as people are leaving prison behind, are no longer incarcerated, um, that they are able to come out, they're, they're living in their communities, working in our communities, and are now able to vote, if, even if they're on probation or parole. And that, um, that's what, you know, half the states have this. This is very normal and a wonderful thing. Um, and it's been such a privilege, because when you work with people who are formerly incarcerated, we actually are out there now going to uh, prisons, to the transition affairs for people about to be released. And that is so important to them. You'd think with all the things they have to worry about, 
It's very important and um, we're very excited to be working on that. Automatic voter registration is a new one coming online, right? So if you interact at all with uh, the DMV and there'll be other things over, um, but you will be automatically registered. We know that helps people get over the line. But some of the things that are maybe less unknown, the permanent absentee ba ballot. Again, you know, the really good news is this is like, we're a really amazing state for voters. If you don't want to go to the polls or you feel unsafe about the polls, or you can just stay home and have, you don't need an excuse, you can just have a permanent absentee ballot sent to your home. And all of these things have all the securities in place, right? So when you get that ballot at home, it is gonna come to you, you have to be in the, in the you know, state voter registration system, it's gonna have a barcode on it, it's gonna to have to be witnessed. There's lots of these things in place that keep mail-in voting as secure as in-person voting, which also has that you know, bipartisan oversight along the way. So um, we also have so many new services for people who don't, who, for whom English is not their, their first language. So the Secretary of State now has all their voting materials in 12 languages which is fabulous, and that's, it's been that way. They just used to be, like Secretary Simon likes to say, it used to be Norwegian, you know, Finnish and French, but we have new languages, and now we have 12. But also, I think something to really remember is that you can bring whoever you want to the polls with you. You don't have to, you know, if you don't know and you haven't been there before, or you don't speak the language, or you just don't even know who to vote for, you can bring your whole family, and you can come and, uh, and you know, come on election day and vote. We still have same-day voter registration in Minnesota, which is, is so strong here. So we're really thrilled with all of the new laws that make voting so much easier and more accessible, bringing new voters in through, um, through Restore the Vote, and again, our 16 and 17-year-olds being able to pre-register. So some, those are some of the big highlights. Yeah, that's the, those are a lot of changes for sure. Uh, so two years ago, Sahan Journal reported on how Minnesota elected the most diverse legislature in the state's history. Michael, I want to ask you, you know, what have political scientists learned about what drives that kind of change? Well, I mean, I, I could give you the answer and just say, oh, people just they debate the ideas and they decide that. Diversity is a great thing, um, and I think that's part of it, but a lot of it is just the changing demographics of the state, of the region, um, and redistricting. Uh, I, I think that had a lot to do with it. Now, it's not everything, because Minnesota is, is, is different. We, we don't, ha like in a lot of other places where you can draw, say, a state house district or a state state senate district that's majority black, majority Latino, that's really hard to do here in Minnesota. Um, you can do it in other states where they have a significant population. So, so it is a common, combination of growing diversity, more people coming in, demographic changes, um, also people in Minnesota just being um, more open to the ideas of having people. Like when I first, when I, when I first moved here, and I, I mean, I, I was aware of Representative Keith Ellison, and I was like, oh, surely that must be a majority black district. Um, and, and again, this was, I'm thinking Congress right now, sorry. Um, and it wasn't. It was a majority white district. Uh, so you're seeing minorities um, racial and ethnic minorities here, um, yes, there's growth in population, but you also see a willingness of whites and other groups to support diversity in Minnesota. So it's a combination of changing demographics and also this willingness and value that diversity matters, um, your perspective, your life experience matters. And, and, and in all fairness, most of the diversity, even though I do mostly I do mostly federal level, so I don't. I want to leave it to the experts here on the state. Um, but I think most of the diversity that's happening in the state legislature is within the Twin Cities area. So, um, so that's part of the the story. So, speaking of that, um, we talked a little bit earlier about how, at least I've seen a growing number of Somali people um, be open to the idea of voting for Trump. Um, and I've seen this in the Hmong community as well. 
Um, but one thing I've heard is a uh, frustration from those communities that Republican vote or Republican Party is not coming and reaching out to them. So, AK, I wanted to ask, what is the party doing about that? Yeah, so this is probably the number one question that gets asked to me all the time. A uh, little bit of background, I've been involved with the Republican Party since 2006. Uh, I was at the University of Minnesota, joined the College Republicans. And so being in uh, CD5, uh, again, the congressional home of, of Keith Ellison, um, I've had this question of like, what do we do, what do we do? And here's what I like to explain to people. Uh, there's no difference uh, from the Republican perspective of what community you're in. It just means like really, like if you go to where I live in Forest Lake versus going, um, let's say to the east side where my wife is from that has a much higher Hmong population, it's not about what can Republicans go and try and tell everyone to do. It's about connecting to people in those communities that already have the values that we have that can align with us. And so Republicans recently have been going into these communities, especially you know, in uh, CD4, which is mostly Ramsey County and St. Paul. Um, we have had multiple candidates now that are from the Hmong community that are building up kind of that, that ground game. The same with, um, again, the East African community. Republicans have been in that community building up the ground game but it's not like this outward appearance, it's, it's from folks that live in the community. And so, you know, this is kind of how I explain things. The idea that the Republican Party, um, or even myself, I'm originally from Devil's Lake, North Dakota, that I could go to North Minneapolis or South Minneapolis and connect with people is kind of absurd. I can connect with rural people a whole lot better because I'm from rural North Dakota. Um, but I will say that what we have been focused on and what we're gonna continue to focus on, especially with myself, um, being part of the Republican Party State Exec Committee, is to go into communities and find people that are just as passionate about where they live as I'm passionate about where I live, because that's really what this comes down to. Um, and, and I just, I do wanna say kind of a, a something that I've kind of heard today on the panel, and I don't think any of you mean it to be in any sort of negative way, but I think it's important for people to understand that Republicans' viewpoint when it comes to elections, when it comes to the automatic voter registration, um, the Republican Party of Minnesota joined together with the RNC. We issued a letter to Secretary of State Steve Simon because someone that was here legally but not an American citizen received an actual ballot. And they notified us because they were afraid that it was going to hurt their chances of becoming a naturalized citizen. So we sent a letter saying, can you explain how this system actually is going to stop the thing that we have a fear of. Now you can say no one should you know, address your fear, but I don't think that's the way that things are supposed to work in an open and free society. If we have concerns, we should be able to address them. And so it's not about do Republicans think that everyone's going out there and being bad faith actors, but more what it is, is we want to make sure that there's a system in place that can actually be robust enough to catch bad faith actors. Because I don't think that most people are actually trying to act in bad faith, I really don't. I prefer a system that every single Minnesotan, every single one that is legal and authorized to vote, goes and votes. I'm also the child of a, of a felon. Um, my father lost his right to vote, and he did everything in his power before he passed away to try and get his voting rights restored. I supported that move in the Minnesota legislature. Again, you do your time, you paid your debts to society, you should be able to fully integrate. I even think that you should be able to get back your Second Amendment rights um, as well. And so these are things that I think are important for everyone to try and kind of understand that for a lot of Republicans, it's about making sure that the system is secure so we know that bad faith actors aren't taking advantage of it. And that's what our concern has always been. But Hopefully that answers your question and kind of dovetails into something else that's been brought up. Thanks. Um, we're going to get to our audience Q&A portion of the event, and we've had uh, we've been collecting que questions all evening. We have a few that have come in. So let's see. We, first question, how do you respond to the sentiment that it's not worth voting because nothing changes in people's lives? I guess this is for anybody. Uh, I'll just jump real quick. This is one of my biggest topics. If you do nothing, why would you ever expect the system to change? And then secondly, I think things when it comes to politics are so much more local than anything else. Like becoming locally involved in your city council, in your school board, and it, like honestly, that's the most um, impactful way to actually get activated. But it, it won't matter if you don't care. But if you want a government that's reflective, 
then you have to take a stand. And listen, I, my brother, I love him very, very much. He is very on the opposite side of me politically. Uh, my father was, he li literally called himself um, a social conflict theorist. So he, he believed that Karl Marx had the right idea. And so I love both of them very, very much. But they should go out and stand for what they believe in. And then we can have this tension, this argument back and forth about what vision do we want for our community. And whoever's ideas win for that election cycle, that's how it goes. So the idea that it doesn't matter to me is a self-fulfilling prophecy if you do nothing. But if you get activated, we see all the time, we just talked about it, you're going to see change that's gonna be reflective of those that actually get out there and do the work and say, I need my government to be reflective of my values and my beliefs. Anybody else? I agree with you to an extent. I think what you talked about local uh, government resonates highly with me. I think um, individuals, um, voters get disenfranchised by what's happening at the national level perhaps even at the state level. But uh, where the true change, and now I'm speaking from a local elected official, that happens in your neighborhoods is really at your local government um, body. That is the school board, that is the city council, that is the county commission. Um, where you really see, I, sometimes I, I compare this to um, whether you're in campaign or a, um, at the national, the federal, the state, or the local level. Imagine um, the, the, an, uh, the, the example that was used with me was imagine um, a boat, like a sailboat. Turning that sailboat is very easy, easier to do at a shorter time period versus at the national level where you're turning, say, a cruise ship. It takes time, it takes direction to change that cruise ship. But when so many sailboats are changing um, uh, at the local level, it's easier to change the direction of that ship at the state level. And then the national, um, the federal level um, is looking to those state and national, um, local governments, right? That's how, you know, I think about earned sick and save time. How many cities across Minnesota um, enacted policies on earned, and, earned sick and save time, Duluth being one of them. Right? Um, and then after that, you saw in the next, really soon after in the legislative cycle, Minnesota taking that up. Um, so local government is extremely important. Um, and if you feel like your vote at the federal, sometimes, you know, it gets, it gets, I myself ask my question, does it matter? The most important thing is to do, get involved in the local level, um, because that's where you'll see the change happening. Um, another question um, I wanted to ask, can panelists speak on the role of questioning the 2020 election uh, results and how that plays into communities of color? Well, um, certainly um, it's a big, I think what we see is when we question uh, results that have been proven, canvassed, certified, brought forward. Um, what it has done, uh, continues to do, because despite the fact that we do have uh, an audit process in here in Minnesota, we observe that, our post-election review, all the things that have gone pla in place, the checks and balances, the system you talk about really is in place in a very a prominent and you know decades proven way. But what it does is it really sows doubt, right? And where there's doubt, there's fear. And where there's fear, it tends to affect those m more marginalized. And, and, and so that's where I see within communities of color and others who are marginalized in our system, they're on that edge of wondering, well, what? I don't know what to expect. I don't know what to think. So that ongoing unwillingness to see the facts for what they are creates a, you know, that tension that I think um, disproportionately affects our communities of color. And, I mean, I think the good news in Minnesota is we're, we're organizing with, with many of our partners. Um, I see Common Cause out here in the audience today working with them and others on our election protection and feel very strongly about protecting our voting rights and the safety of our election workers. Um, but um, I can also tell you I've been in many rooms just within this year. Uh, we have many people mobilizing who still believe 
uh, we're not in a safe space. They don't, that do, don't believe the elections. And, and I say be an election judge. I mean, that's really your, your first thing. But it's, it's a real issue that we need to continue to address. You know, I, I, I say this in class. It's a dangerous game. Um, I mean, I understand politics is about, you know, who gets what, when, how quickly. Uh, parties are built to win elections. But I mean, we all live in the same country, right? And so the rhetoric of trying to say elections are legitimate when you don't win kind of just destroys the whole process of having elections, right? And so to try to de delegitimize electoral results, I mean, look, minority communities understand this quite well where they can question. In 2000, there were a lot of concerns with Bush v. Uh, Bush versus Gore in Florida in terms of the voting machines and all of that. Some people probably thought some things were going on, but for the most part at the end, everyone kind of accepted the result. Uh, most people, right? There's some people that were saying that Bush wasn't legitimate, but at the most part, but the political leaders, the losing side said, we don't like it, but we have to move on and we're gonna accept the results. And so the, the, the thing about the 2020 election, which bothers me a lot, anyone who cares about democracy and fair play, this isn't a Democrat, this isn't a Republican issue. I mean, everyone gets in there. If you win, you win. If you lose, you got a chance to come back again. But to delegitimize a system that we tried to resolve our differences, uh, we let the p voters, the groups decide who should win, but to start saying that elections only matter and they're only legitimate when I win, that is a dangerous precedent. And what's happening is you're starting to see people say if, let's just say if Harris wins, right? You know, I, people should be afraid, right? Because everyone's, we've already heard things that like, it's not legitimate. And so that, those type of things I, I think really just crush and they just keep building on each other and delig and then people will start saying, well, why turn out to vote? This person isn't my president. This person isn't my representative. We don't, we don't want that in our system. Can I just add one thing? I, the democracy point I think is just so, so important. The second piece actually, to me, it's actually covertly predatory. And what I mean by that is, you have communities of color who historically have not had access to the ballot box. I mean, when Minnesota started as a state, none of us would have been able to vote, right? Under federal law. And so when you think about that, that existence for generations, many people rightly would believe, this system wasn't set up for me, therefore why should I participate? This type of argument, that it's rigged, that you're not actually informing what's happening, that this is not a self-determined society, but rather it's a rigged game, actually is seeking to exploit that legitimate concern that many African Americans and others have as a result of the history, right? And so it's in addition to being anti-democratic, which is already bad in and of itself, it is actually predatory to some of the deep concerns, the legitimate concerns that African Americans and others have had in this country. And if I can obviously, as the resident Trumper on the panel, um, you know, this is a question that I think it, we want to try and paint it that it's so clear and obvious and there's no nuance to it that Donald Trump said 2020 was stolen. But here's the thing about President Trump is that he always tries to bring up an issue to get it into the minds of people to have a further discussion. As someone that watched it and that as a Republican that wants Republicans to be able to win elections, my biggest concern was are the issues that are being raised being addressed? And if you say there's nothing to worry about, shut up and move on, and you're talking to like 33% of the population, that is a recipe for disaster. And so the position that Republicans have had, the Republicans have held, that I've talked to so many different Republicans about, is again, about making sure that the grievances that we have are adjudicated in a lawful system. A lot of lawsuits were thrown out. That just adds fuel to the fire. And I will say that it is becoming that every election, if President Trump wins, the question is, are there going to be Democrats 
that say the election was stolen or the election. And it seems like we're building up to that point. In 2016, I know that Hillary Clinton ended up saying that yes, she lost, but she did say what happened. You know, was the system hacked? Was it Russia? Was it whatever? Down in Georgia, you had Stacey Abrams again saying that the elections were somehow stolen. So there's this back and forth that I think creates this tension. But myself as a person that loves this country, that wants this country to actually um, succeed, is that we have to be able to find a balance where you can't say if you're a quote unquote an election denier that somehow you no longer, you know, that your voice or your opinion doesn't matter. And I know that some people might argue and say, you can't prove a negative. And I, I don't want you to prove a negative. I want to go through, again, if a grievance is filed, go through that adjudication process. And once it's adjudicated and the merits of that question have been answered, then we move forward. And I think this is the problem. We talk about our democracy being in threat. And we talk about our constitutional republic being in threat. If these issues are not actually adjudicated through the legal process and the merits of the arguments instead of being thrown out on standing, then it leaves this question mark and eventually our nation will have to face it. And I think the better we face it, um, you know, the sooner the better for our nation. So I just have to point out as the lawyer on the panel here, they were thrown out not on standing, they were thrown out on the merits. A motion to dismiss dismisses a case on the merits, okay? There were 70 lawsuits filed, okay? across jurisdictions all over the country. The Trump campaign and their allies can present any evidence that there was something wrong. None of them were substantiated on the merits. This idea that it was standing is simply just not true. The second point I'd wanna point out is this concern over the system, and I'm not saying there aren't things we could do to be better, of course not, but the idea that there's this concern over the system when the reason Republicans are losing is because of their bad ideas. They have not won Minnesota since 1972. They have not won a statewide election since 2006. Your problem is not the voting systems, it is your ideas and the, and the voters continue to reject them. So I think there should be more time put into what do the people want so you can get their vote instead of saying, we keep losing, how do we stop people from voting or remove the confidence in the electoral system? So I just had to point that out because it is just simply not true that these were kicked out on standing. I worked on some of these cases. I know them. I'm and, telling you, and they were wanna, not. I just wanna clarify, when I, when I, I'm not a lawyer, but I'm saying, going through the process of saying, okay, we're gonna have this open system that all of these issues are check line, the arguments are made, and then there's a final determination made by a judge versus saying the judge reviewed it and without having arguments in an actual court trial. But there were that, arguments, that's and, what I'm saying. And I'm, not, and I'm saying that for a lot of them, that was not the case. And for listeners or watchers, anyone that's watching, go and look it up yourself. I'm just letting you know that from this viewpoint, you can either reject and say that you're crazy, you don't get a voice, and that's fine, but I think that that doesn't do a whole lot when it comes to having a percentage of the population, because this is the question. Look, poll after poll. What percentage of Republicans believe that something wrong happened? And if you don't address that issue, then we're never going to be able to move forward. I want us to move forward. I love this nation. I love my Democrats and even my Marxist friends. I love you. I just think you have bad ideas. Um, and ultimately, that's what we need to be able to do. So. Again, I just want to say that until it's actually addressed in a way that we feel is satisfying, then I guess even if it gets thrown out on merit versus on standing, if it's okay, if we I'm still sorry, don't feel we, satisfying. we have to move on here. I, we, we got time for one more uh, or one more audience question. It's how do panelists believe their parties can welcome others into their coalition? For example, Republicans with Arab Americans who feel differently on Gaza. Israel Palestine, but are otherwise aligned with Democrats uh, on uh, with social issues or immigration, but otherwise aligned. Sorry about that. So, uh, you know, from the Democratic perspective, I feel like we are we, we are Noah's Ark. I mean, we got everybody, right? We we got blacks, we got whites, we got gay, straight, we have everybody. Um, so, I think we are very inclusive um, in terms of um, identity. The, the second thing I would say is on policy, I would argue the Democratic Party is very diverse. We, 
I mean, Gaza is a perfect example of that. There is a constant debate. I always say, I'm not a member of an organized party, I'm a member of the Democratic Party. There's debates always within the party. So this idea that the Democratic Party is not diverse in all its forms, I think actually is just simply not true. Um, and I would put our record on diversity, although it is not perfect, although we have made mistakes, and we've done things that have been harmful to communities of color, for example, the crime bill in the 1990s, to in whole, I would put up our record against the post-1940s Republican Party any day of the week. And what I'll say is that when it comes to the idea of diversity, we are kind of standing from different, or starting from different standing points. Um, on the right, on Republican side, we want to be more of like individualists, like collectivist identity is something that is not natural to the way that we view the world. And so when it happens to be that you have a group of people that are growing in number, um, for instance, in Minnesota in 2020, somewhere around 31% of black males voted for President Trump that voted, you start to see that there's something else that's resonating and that number is growing. Some estimates that it might be as high as 40, even 45% of, again, black males voting for President Trump and voting for Republicans. We also have the log cabin Republicans as well, right? Um, I, when I was out at the RNC, I was able to meet with the national log cabin Republicans, Rick Grinnell, who was the first openly uh, gay cabinet member that was appointed by President Trump in 2020. Um, and so I think that our diversity looks a little bit different because, you know, again, we don't have that same mindset. I'm not saying that it's bad. I fundamentally disagree with it. I don't like collectivist idea or mentality, but that's why there's a little bit of a difference. But you are starting to see, though, again, um, when, it looks, when you look at Trump and you look at Republicans, the, the groups that are starting to align with us, we're almost winning millennials based off of polling. Um, Gen Z is even, it's like in the like, low 30s. That number is increasing. And again, um, Hispanic, black, um, and, and even um, Asian Americans, that number is growing with Republicans. So things are becoming more diverse. We're not gonna win versus the Democrats because it's just a difference in mentality of where we start from um, as an ideological belief. And I, I just wanna um, say that we only have time for one last question. And I wanna make sure that each person gets a response and has a sentence. Um, try to keep it short to a sentence. Um, I just wanna ask, um, What's exciting to you to continue doing this work that you're in right now? Well, for sure, we, we, I mean, we're, we're hanging out with people who are really excited to vote, whose rights have uh, it's been difficult to access their rights. They're able to access them in new ways. Um, and we want to make sure uh, that they are protected as they go out to vote, um, that they have the information they need, but also the inspiration and the confidence to vote. And to remind them that, you know, we may not, you know, how many of us all, you know, believe, you know, everything our friends say, or we all agree with our friends or our family or even our faith community, we don't always agree with everyone, but we have this tremendous opportunity to participate in our democracy, and we need to take it. I enjoy the free debate of ideas um, in the classroom with the students and to t have a space uh, to talk about, not to just go to church and have people agree with everything that you believe in, but to really debate some of these ideas, think about alternatives, think about um, your perspective and where, I mean, in Minnesota, I mean, students come, University of Minnesota students come from all over, from small towns, from big cities. So, you know, if you're in the Twin Cities, you think, oh, everyone thinks this way, and then you find someone out in outstate Minnesota doesn't think that way, and people are shocked. And so I, I really like when students, when you can have that vigorous debate and think, uh, have these ideas, because these are the students that are going to go out and be leaders. You know, they're going to be leaders of organizations. They're going to be leaders at uh, politicians, uh, in government, in business. And so it's good to just have them for a brief moment to talk about these very important ideas. For me, it's about going out there and having conversations with people that sometimes strike a nerve. I think that's the most important thing 
when it comes to like actually trying to govern, trying to actually hold power for your political party, is that there's gonna always be this tension, but I love people, and so going and having very difficult conversations with people that have preconceived notions is most exciting to me, and as Abu had already alluded to, Republicans haven't won presidential race in Minnesota since 72, we haven't won a state ride race, uh, race since 2006, so I like a challenge. Are these the last comments? Yeah, last comment. Okay. Uh, well, thank you so much for having us here, and um, it, it was very exciting to be up here with such passionate individuals. Um, I think the seating arrangement was very interesting. I feel like I was playing a tennis match half the time. Um, but what excites me is really my constituents. Um, I've seen my constituents. I've gotten hundreds and thousands well, in general, like hundreds of emails um, regarding Gaza and regarding um, their values and American values that they stand for. And I've seen those constituents rally behind the ceasefire resolution, individuals of across the city of all different identities come together to work on a ceasefire resolution that is neutral, that is supported by a vast majority of people. I've seen folks show up to the uncommitted vote and continue to push and hold our leaders accountable, that we need an arms embargo and we need a permanent ceasefire a permanent and immediate ceasefire and I've seen for the past three plus months an encampment uh, a Gaza solidarity encampment in front of City Hall um, that is also welcoming uh, welcomed the um, uh, the unsheltered population in Duluth that got together to make this beautiful community of solidarity, of support, and recognizing um, that we need to do better as elected officials, we need to do better as party uh, leaders, we need to do better as human beings to find our empathy and our compassion. Um, and that's what, uh, when I see my constituents turn out in local elections, in local government, and the state and national, that's what excites me. It's the people that's moving our nation forward. What excites me is every two years we get to redefine who we want to be. Um, it's, it's pretty simple. That, that idea, the vast majority of people in the world will never experience that. The idea we get to redefine who we are every two years. And in this moment, we actually get to reject, in my opinion, neo-fascism. And we get to embrace true principles of, of modern day freedom. Freedom of your bodily autonomy. Freedom from poverty. Freedom towards a more just society. So that's what excites me, the idea that we get to actually participate in our own liberation. Um, and I think that's something that we should all not take for granted and assume this is just how, somehow the way the world works. There's so many people across the world that do not have this opportunity. That's what I'm excited about. All right, well, we wanna thank everyone at the Wellstone Center for inviting us into this amazing performance space. Thanks to NPR News and SPNN who helped us record and live stream this community conversation. Finally, thanks so much to all of you who joined us here in St. Paul and tuned in to watch and listen. And thanks to our panelists, of course. Uh, we'll see you in October for another Sahan Community Conversation. Everybody have a good night. <laughs>